All right, it's great to see you this morning. Welcome to Grace Chapel. Yeah, we're, we're saying in the back that uh, the good thing about this Wednesday morning is it almost feels like a Friday, right? Almost feels like a Friday. And whether uh, we're going to get some rest in these next couple of days or whether we're actually just going to enjoy a different kind of rhythm, the fact of the matter is we have a little bit of a break. But the cool thing this morning is that we begin, are able to begin this time of break in the posture of community worship. So I'm glad that you've decided to come and be a part of this experience this morning. Um, we want to truly practice community worship with one another this morning. We also want to take an opportunity to, you know, y'all are here for a particular purpose. You all are uh, studying for particular kinds of vocations. How about that? There it is. That sounds good. There's another one. If I didn't have your attention before, I do now, right? We're all studying for different kinds of vocation. But the fact of the matter is, because we're here at TFC, we're not just studying vocation for vocation's sake. We're here because we want whatever it is that we do vocationally to be pointed in the direction of the kingdom. So we're going to explore that kind of theme this morning. And so I want to invite you to stand. And as we do so, let's continue in community worship this morning as we sing together.
of worship. Um, it's going to be on the screens in just a second, and we're just going to worship in this way, because worship is more than just singing. Um, it's also declaring the truths of the Lord. Um, so if you would just repeat after me. We have gathered in the name of Jesus Christ. We have come to this house to worship God. We have come to confess that Jesus is Lord. We are not here to be entertained. We are here to encounter the sacred. We are worshipers. We praise and adore the living God, who is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And amen if you agree with that. Let's just sing this chorus with these words in our minds. Let us become more aware of your presence let us experience the glory of your goodness let us become more aware of your presence let us experience the glory of your good let us become let us become more aware of your presence let us experience the glory of your sing that one more time let us become more aware of your presence let us experience the glory of your goodness this is our prayer tonight Hear the word of the Lord from Exodus 29, 44 through 46. So I will consecrate the tent of meeting and the altar and will consecrate Aaron and his sons to serve me as priests. Then I will dwell among the Israelites and be their God. They will know that I am the Lord their God who brought them out of Egypt so that I might dwell among them. I am the Lord their God. That's good news that he's dwelling among us. He's here among us. We, our prayer is that we would be more aware of that. Let's sing this again. Let us become more aware of your presence. Let us experience the glory of your good. Make it your prayer. Let us become more aware of your response on the screens and I would love if you guys would just respond with everything in you as a prayer in your presence there is freedom 
in your presence. In your presence, there is healing. No matter how far I run, your love is everlasting. God, you never leave us. Your glory has no end. We believe that today. Let's sing this chorus again. Make it your prayer that we would be more aware of his presence in our lives today. Let us become more aware of your presence. Let us experience the glory of your goodness. Let us become more aware of your presence. Let us experience the glory of your goodness. this final prayer out with me today and we'll go back into that chorus you will be our guide to the end to the end the Lord is with us he will not forsake us say amen if you believe that today one more time let us become let us become more aware of your presence let us experience the glory of your goodness let us become more aware of your presence it's our prayer let us experience the glory of your that you would awaken us, that you would awaken our eyes to see you, to see you moving here today, God, because you are. It's not a question of whether you're here or not. It's whether we see you or not, God, because you are here. I pray that you would awaken us, that we would become more aware of your presence, God. And it's in the name of Jesus that I pray. Amen. I invite you to be seated. You know, when the people of God come together to worship like this, it becomes kind of a microcosm of the rest of life. 
as we begin to center ourselves as the body of Christ under the lordship of Jesus, as we begin to, to recognize and acknowledge that his presence is constant, it gives us a way to begin to look at all of the rest of life as a time for to be present with God and to be a part of what it is that he's doing, not only in our lives, but particularly as we engage the lives of others. And so we're kind of beginning a time uh, over the next couple of weeks where we begin to look at this. As we begin to say, regardless of whatever it is, vocation it is that God is preparing us for, how do we see that very vocation, our preparation for it and even living into it, as a way of participating in God's good kingdom dream in and through that vocation. And so this morning, uh, we have a new professor here at TFC this fall. Her name is Caitlin Thompson. Uh, she is assistant professor of teacher education. She's finishing up her doctoral work, her EDS, at, uh, at Columbia International University. She'll be done in December. She's very excited. She told me that actually she turns in her final coursework this weekend. That is something to be excited about. Excited about. Yes. I wanted you to have a chance, though, to hear Caitlin's story because her story is about what we just described having a love for education and re beginning to pray and to dream about how God could use her love for education and to point it in the direction of the kingdom so that she could be a part of what God is doing, not only in her own life but in the world. And my prayer this morning is that as she shares her story, it might awaken your own imagination for your own stories about how your vocation that you're studying for here can be pointed in that direction as well. And so let us continue to worship this morning as we hear Caitlin's story and hear her challenge. Good morning. So I'm a new face for a lot of you. I, as Mr. Stratton said, I'm a new faculty member in the School of Teacher Education, but I'm also a TFC alum, and I spent many years sitting exactly where you are now, um, listening as different speakers shared about their lives and their ministries. I feel incredibly privileged to have the opportunity to share with you this morning. I am much more nervous than I anticipated, so I apologize if that comes across to you. But I am excited to get to share with you something um, that's really close to my heart and something about which I'm passionate. As Mr. Stratton said, this morning um, I was asked to share a little about education and kingdom building. And you may be wondering how those two are really even related. My hope is that by the end of community worship this morning, you'll have a different perspective on the roles to which God calls people in order to build his kingdom and spread his message. So even as a student at TFC, I had a pretty narrow idea of what mission was. I had spent my whole life listening to stories from contemporary missionaries as they told about the work they were doing around the world. And I had grown up reading about people like Amy Carmichael and Gladys Aylward and Hudson Taylor who had devoted their entire lives uh, to serving overseas and spreading the gospel. The problem was, I didn't feel like I had been called to serve in that way. But how could that be? The Great Commission is for everyone. Um, I wanted to serve, and I wanted to be involved in the work going on around the world, but I didn't know what that looked like. I let my picture of what the ideal missionary looked like and my fear of not living up to that ideal um, really cloud my vision and fill me with doubts. Because you see, God had given me gifts and he was helping me develop skills and he had placed desires in my heart that were all coalescing to become a called. It wasn't until I started looking at who he had created me to be instead of longing to be something else, that I was really able to see the part I could play in his kingdom work. So scripture makes it clear that God designed people to have different abilities and gifts. From the record of the workmen in the Old Testament who collaborated to build the tabernacle, to Paul's descriptions in 1 Corinthians 12 and Romans 12, it's clear that God brings unity out of diversity. The body of Christ functions effectively because God has equipped us differently. 
and he's called us to serve in a variety of ways. As a student, I began to see how God could weave together the different parts of my life and direct those into his kingdom work. I was interested in education, and I could see how God was preparing me to one day be a teacher. I was also fascinated by other countries and cultures and wanted to experience what life was like outside the U.S., I also desperately wanted to play a part in the work that was going on around the world. And thankfully, while a student at TFC, God placed certain key people in my life who began to show me how all of those things could happen. I'd been vaguely aware of the different kinds of schools that existed around the world, but it had never really occurred to me to think about teaching internationally. At some point, I met a TFC alum who was an international worker in Indonesia. She described to me the schools that her kids attended and how much of a need those schools met in their lives and in her family's ministries. I was also learning about how important a role education can play in opening up areas for gospel access. Education is used to reach people who might otherwise never come into contact with the message of scripture. And I discovered that TFC actually had an opportunity to complete my student teaching in an international setting. So during my senior year of college, I packed two suitcases and flew to Indonesia to live and teach for four months. Mind you, I hadn't been out of the country since I was four, and I had never been so far from my family. I've dealt with anxiety and depression since I was in high school, and now I had just flown across the world by myself. And it was amazing. It was one of the hardest things I have ever done, but it was one of the most formative experiences of my life. I was finally beginning to see how God was using my talents and my skills and my desires in a way that I had never imagined or envisioned before. That four-month student teaching experience led to a permanent position a year later as a second grade teacher in Indonesia. Once I got there, I began to see how education could be a tool to reach those who aren't believers and could also meet a need for people who are working to share the gospel. My school's philosophy and purpose played a key role in this. It incorporated elements of both discipleship and evangelism. Many of our students came from believing families and had made professions of faith. So for those students, our goal was to help them grow in their knowledge of God and deepen their relationship with him. We had Bible classes and spiritual emphasis weeks, outreach weeks, um, things that you'd likely be very familiar with um, were you to see them. However, we didn't require students to come from believing backgrounds or families um, who were believers. A college preparatory education in English is such a valuable commodity that parents are willing to let their students be educated from a biblical worldview, even if they are not believers themselves. They knew that we taught from and about the Bible, and they didn't really care. Many students came from Buddhist backgrounds. There were some from nominally religious or non-religious backgrounds. And in those cases, our goal was to help them see their need for Christ and to lead them in recognizing that need and accepting the gospel. Each year in my class, I had students who came from non-religious or um, backgrounds other than Christianity. Ginny and our older sister, Diana, had moved to Indonesia from Korea prior to enrolling at my school. Her family was in Indonesia for business um, and they didn't follow any religion. Diana, a ninth grader, came to faith very shortly after the school year began as a result of her teacher's impact and the truth that she was hearing. So Diana began praying for the rest of her family. She prayed and prayed for months. And during those months, Ginny in my class was hearing the truth and learning more about who God is and what he had done for her. Halfway through the spring semester, Ginny came to me and told me that she was ready to accept Jesus into her life. So she and I prayed together, 
And the first thing she did after that was go and find Diana and tell her what she had done. I don't know if Jenny's parents have come to faith yet. I know that both Diana and Jenny began praying for them and are still continuing to do that. And I know the Korean families um, in the area really rallied around them. Um, but they're a family I continue to lift up when, when I think about them. So my curriculum in second grade focused on Bible heroes and character traits, beginning with Abraham and progressing through the New Testament to Paul and Silas. The lessons about Abraham always reference the universal blessing, the blessing given to Abraham that all nations would receive that blessing through him. And I told my students that we were going to revisit this idea later in the year when we talked about Jesus. One of my students, Jin Yong, raised his hand and said, who's Jesus? I had never had such a point blank question like that. I'm not even quite sure what I told him, but I do know throughout that year, Jin Yong absolutely soaked up the stories we were learning. He was an incredibly bright kid and loved learning new things, and he was fascinated by the stories of how God used people in both the Old and the New Testaments, though sometimes they were difficult for him. One week, the lesson centered on Elijah and the prophets of Baal, and how Elijah defeated the prophets of Baal at Mount Carmel. The retelling included the part where Elijah went and killed the 450 prophets of Baal afterward. Jin Yong looked up at me with a puzzled look on his face and said, but I thought God said not to kill people. Because remember, we had talked about the Ten Commandments earlier in the year. You want to talk about a challenging conversation to have with seven-year-olds. At Christmas time, we talked about Jesus' birth, and at Easter, we talked about his death and resurrection. Shortly after that, Jin Yong was ready to put his faith in Jesus, and he prayed with me and asked for forgiveness for his sins. Moments to share truth didn't just occur in Bible class, though. One day, our science lesson was talking about the characteristics of animals, in this case, mammals. And we talked about how animals make like animals. We shared examples. For instance, a dog will never have a kitten. Dogs have puppies. One of my students, I could see on his face that he was thinking through this. He had only been in Indonesia for two or three years and had only been speaking English for a year or two. So at times, he struggled to translate his Korean thoughts into English sentences. He looked at me, though, and he said, my mom told me monkeys get upgrade, have thumbs. And I sat and thought for a minute, and I realized he was trying to ask me how the idea of humans coming from monkeys, which his family had shared with him, was compatible with this idea that animals make like animals. Because of where I was and what I was doing, I was able to share with him that while some people believe that, I in fact believed that God had created humans. We were made in his image. We were made for a purpose. And that I believe that because that's what the Bible said. I would never denigrate what his parents believed, but I was free to share the truth with him. Education also served as a way to reach the parents in our community. They would come multiple times throughout the year to see their students in performances and events music recitals, plays, art shows, and all of those were presented from a biblical worldview. I helped lead an English language club for some of the moms in our community, and we would explicitly share the gospel during those times. Many of our families were curious about why we had left our homes and our families and our countries, particularly those of us who were single, to teach in Indonesia. This opened the door to discuss our real motivation for being there. Education served as a support function for a lot of the families in my area who were involved in ministry and evangelism. Around the world, huge numbers of young people are growing up in countries other than their passport country. Some of them are growing up in areas that don't have adequate educational systems. 
many of those students are going to choose to return to their passport country for college or university experiences, and they need to be academically prepared to do that. For a lot of them, my school served as a bridge between their worlds. One of the most important things I saw during my years there was how God was using my role to help me grow in my understanding of who he was and who he had made me to be. I could tell story after story of the ways I saw God's favor and faithfulness and guidance in my life during those years. In some ways, I think it's easier to see those things for what they are when you're in an environment where you have a limited knowledge of the dominant culture um, and language. It's a lot harder to rely on yourself when you have the language proficiency of a five-year-old. One event happened early in my time there that really drove this point home for me. Six months into my first year there, I had finally gained enough courage to drive my motorbike into town, which was about 45 minutes away. If you're bored later today or need something to do while you're procrastinating, Google traffic in Indonesia, and you will see why it took me six months. So after driving into town with some friends, I decided I was gonna go home before the rest of them, and I started out on my own. I was confident I knew the route. Now, no street signs, no real landmarks, but I had done it a couple of times with friends, and so I headed out. After about an hour, I realized I was lost. I knew I should have gotten to my neighborhood already, and nothing looked familiar. I stopped a couple of times to ask people where my neighborhood was, mind you, proficiency of about a five-year-old. So in my broken Indonesian, I'm asking them, trying to understand what they're saying, and really all I got was that they kept saying, oh, truce, truce, meaning, oh, keep going. Great. One person threw in the word, oh, jow, meaning, oh, that's far. Great. So I kept driving. After another hour, I called a friend. And she, of course, is asking me, oh, well, where are you? And I'm looking around going, I have no idea. She's like, well, do you see anything you recognize? No. I mean, if I did, I'd be home. At this point, I'm starting to get overwhelmed. None of my friends who actually spoke Indonesian, and I could have handed my phone to a local to talk to, they weren't picking up their phones. So I started thinking, well, what happens if I can't get home? I can't communicate well. I have no idea where I am. It's at this point that I managed to drive into the wheel well of a truck I was trying to pass. I pinned my pant leg in between the truck and the motorbike, and I'll never forget the look on the passenger's face as he leaned out the window and saw a white girl being dragged along with his truck. <laughs> a couple of men ran up, tore my pant legs, pulled me off the bike, and thankfully managed to pry my bike out of the wheel well. Remarkably, it still worked, and I got on, and I kept driving. Because at that point, I had no idea what to do. I had been praying since I started out, but at that point, I remember telling God, all right, I'm at the end. I have no idea what to do. It's completely illogical to keep doing what I'm doing and hope something different's going to happen. But that's exactly what I did. And I prayed with every sign I came to that somehow it was going to say, Kota Baru Parahyangan, which is where I lived. And somehow, by God's grace alone, I ended up on the right road. I don't know how and I don't know when, but I ended up under that green sign that I was looking for. I pulled into my neighborhood and my front tire went flat. It had lasted the last hour that I needed to get home. And as soon as I knew where I was, it popped. I was at the absolute end of myself, but God had been there the whole time. So what does this mean for you? I've shared my story about some of my giftings and my desires, but that's going to look different for you. I want to leave you with two thoughts. One, 
realize that God has given you gifts, talents, and desires that are meant to be used to build his kingdom and participate in his work of redemption and reconciliation. Your role might look different from the people around you. It might even look different than what you've always imagined. Those gifts and abilities can be used and are needed both locally and globally. I'm once again in a season where I'm relearning what it means to serve in the U.S. Whether you're pursuing business, counseling, medicine, education, sports management, or community development, whatever it is, your work can be used to make an impact for the gospel. The second thing is this. Consider going overseas, even if it's just for a short-term trip, like a study abroad program. And don't go with the idea that you're there to help or give. Instead, go with a desire to learn and grow because your time overseas will give you a new perspective that you wouldn't have otherwise. And you'll learn more about yourself, which admittedly is both encouraging and depressing. Finally, you'll learn more about God, his nature and his heartbeat for the world. Thanks for letting me share my story and I hope it encourages you to see yours in a different light. Just in the next few minutes that we have this morning, I just want to invite you. You might be a, a faculty person here. You might be a staff person. You might be a student. You might be someone who's just visiting. I want to just take the next couple of minutes, and I want to invite you to begin to look at what you're doing in life. Take a look at what you're doing in life. Take a look at where you're headed in life. How can we this morning, in a concluding time of prayer, begin to open our lives up to God and say, God, I want this to be about your kingdom. I want you to use the things that I love, the things that I'm preparing to do, the things that I'm learning here. I want you to use it for what it is that you're doing in this world. I want to I want to saddle up aside, uh, alongside you. Would you help me do that? And so just in these next couple of moments, I want to just invite you to bow your heads. I want you to to envision what it is that you're doing now, what you hope to do in the future. And in these next few moments, just say, God, would you shape this in me so that it can point to your kingdom? Father, as we read your story from Genesis to Revelation, and as we continue to think about it, Lord, from the book of Revelation even to our present day, we learn that you are a God on mission in the world, and you invite us to be a part of your mission in this world. And Lord, you envision our participation in so many diverse and varied kinds of ways. You're calling doctors. Lord, you're calling pastors, you're calling nurses, you're calling educators, you're calling people to run businesses, you're calling people to work in civil service, you're, you're calling people to work in all different kinds of ways and vocations. And in each of those vocations, you're inviting us to be a part of what you're doing in the world, to truly have those vocations, Lord, pointing to your kingdom and so Lord give us the courage this morning maybe in a new and fresh way to really 
give ourselves and our vocation to you. And to begin to create the conditions in our lives, Lord, now and as we head into the future, to truly be a part of what it is that you're doing in this world. Give us the courage, Lord. Shape in us the kind of skills and the kind of life that will enable us to do so. We pray that this morning. Heavenly Father, in the name of your Son, Jesus, and by the power of your Spirit. And the people of TFC said, Amen. Have a nice fall break.